each other, learn from experts that we admire. All right. I don't think that I can hear myself. I've figured out that I absolutely must mute myself if I have the Twitch open because otherwise it, it that echo gets really plot. crazy the just Twitch, forever. Is, so is, <laughs> hopefully uh... that's sorted. But I mean, technically we have two minutes before we said we were gonna go live, but I'm gonna have to figure out the other screen soon. But we're live, so hey. hi, I'm Rachel. And I'm Steven. And uh, we are the Faint Divinities. We are a newer channel. I think I'm going to turn down the music just to make okay. sure that it's not super loud. But Yeah, we're not fighting over it. Yeah, we're, we're a new <laughs> channel, and uh, we are here specifically to talk about Daggerheart. So Daggerheart is a new tabletop RPG, uh, specifically similar if you are new to tabletop role-playing games or TTRPG. They're similar to... Dungeons and Dragons especially it takes a lot of flavor from other games specifically but I think that when you're looking at the community that's going to be coming over a lot of the fans of this Daggerheart group are going to be coming from Critical Role and their new publishing house Darrington Press specifically uh, because Critical Role are the masterminds behind Daggerheart. So as part of that, because Critical Role has historically, at least for all of their live careers, although they started in Pathfinder when they were, it was Pathfinder before they started uh, going, yeah, right, right? Yeah, before they went live, uh, they were playing in a Pathfinder homebrew campaign and then uh, switched over to 5e for um, Sundry, right? when they when geek and Sundry and Felicia Day's yeah. group initially started working with them, yeah. So... Mm -hmm. So when they initially started going live and playing it in a context with an audience, not specifically in a home game, they switched to Dungeons Dungeons and Dragons. And I think it was always 5th mm -hmm. edition because that's what was current. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, it was current at the time. It was always 5th edition. It was uh, uh, first, like, first edition 5th edition. But... Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It was sure. very early on in 5th edition. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Well, because that is what a decade ago now. Oh, it's literally mm -hmm. nine it, years it of streaming. Did you hear that? That yeah, critical that role. Wild. That's crazy to me. I feel. I mean, good for them. Like, yeah. <laughs> they're living yeah, the dream. <laughs> but it's crazy because it just doesn't. You know, I started watching them in 2015 mm. when they were in the Briarwood arc. And yeah. so for me to realize that I was nine years younger when I started watching them, upsetting news. Absolutely yeah, hated yeah. to find it out. It, it's absolutely <laughs> so, wild. Yeah. But um, but anyway, so as part of this release and just as a note it's not technically out yet right now it's in open beta so yeah. with the open beta they very graciously just like three weeks ago at this point uh they put it into open beta out into the world for people to begin play testing the experience which i don't know if anybody else has pieced this together but i really love this Part of what they want to do with Daggerheart, right, is have this experience where you are building, the players have as much agency at the table as the GM does. And I kind of feel like, I don't think this is a nod to that, but I do think it's kind of wonderful that in that same vein, the creators of Daring to, of Daggerheart, the Darrington Press group and Spencer Stark and that group, they are all engaging with their players if they're the yeah, gms it's, it's super investing like they are really like building back into just like the whole the whole uh fan base you know yeah yeah it does like at least the 
I actually do feel like, and I have some things that I'm really curious about and critical to see as well, because I don't know, but everything that I see, every concern that I've had so far, I find myself kind of falling back into place of being excited about it but (laughs) I'm trying not to speak too flowery about it honestly but when I'm reading a lot of it it feels like a love letter to fans of tabletop RPG fans of critical role fans of gaming in general we're gonna talk about the fastball special but as a chrono trigger girly (laughs) like that is just that's straight up a love letter to people you know yeah. so the tag team attack is super fascinating just the idea of like oh. uh even it being like a one session per player kind of thing but it like builds up these like really like dynamic kind of things that can go on but yeah we'll get into that yeah yeah yeah. yeah i'm getting way ahead of myself and i will forever <laughs> call it fastball special i think that's it's just fair, in my fair. head it's just too late um okay so but Anyway, so as a very brief recap, you know, the Critical Role and their publishing house, Darrington Press, have put out this new tabletop RPG, uh, specifically called Daggerheart. It is in open beta right now, and that's what our channel is going to be about. We want to have um, talks about the new system itself. We want to play the game. We have a group of people who are going to be sitting a session zero next week, which I will be... GMing or DMing as the Dagger Master, and I'm the Dagger Master. The Dagger Master. I'm very excited and super nervous for it. Um, and you know, to give a little bit of context about myself and Stephen, we are two nerds. Uh, we definitely are. We've been friends since we were kids, and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that I think. I had an interest in Dungeons and Dragons and I came to Steven and I was like, if I learn to GM, would you play? <laughs> I was said most certainly. Yeah. I said, so... All I have to do is sit at the table and enjoy myself. No stress yeah. in. <laughs> that really was like almost a decade ago at this point, but you took GM reins very soon after, you know? Yeah, yeah. It definitely was something that I loved the idea of like not only playing, but like actually like running games because, you know, when you're, when you're running, you get a kind of, you know, all the secrets. And mm-hmm. Nothing's more fun than knowing all the secrets. Well, and getting to like, it's so It's, you know, I'm so invested into the philosophy of tabletop RPG, but just like getting to create a world and then let your friends play in the sandbox that is your imagination and make a story Mm -hmm. together is just really beautiful. And I really try not to engage in this conversation in like regular people society, but I am too invested in it anyway. (laughs) I really like yeah. the eyebrow that happens. So once in a while, the 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 talk starts, and I feel feel it slipping out, and I'm like, oh, I'm in public. Rain it in a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> I just realized also that I meant to have the Dagger Heart website specifically open, so I've switched over to that. It was the demi plane <laughs> one. We'll talk about that later, but it, it, it's a it's a cool feature. We'll get there. Yeah. So the you know that's what we're here to do. We're here to talk about the game itself. We're here to uh, play the game with different Very people. Much. Yeah, and we have some really exciting people who are going to be on it. We've kind of picked a cast that I think is really exciting. We have people with a lot of experience, both playing and GMing, so that the burden isn't on one or the other of us. We have people who have a good amount of experience with playing and then we have uh oh ooh, spotify crazy uh you can still hear me just fine right i'm getting like an audio yeah. error okay great um right. so, yeah, no, i can hear you just fine okay cool so um we have excited most exciting for me we have two people who should be playing with us who have never played any tabletop rpg at all i'm very excited about that I think like a lot of us, though, one of the reasons that they were willing to give it a shot is because of Baldur's Gate 3, right? It's yeah, released. Yeah. It has made the concept of tabletop RPG accessible to like everyone. Yeah. So mm-hmm. anyway. The people that had the had the toes in the water that were considering and looking at stuff online, once it became accessible at home without having to put yourself out there, 
uh, it opened up a lot of people's eyes to how much fun it could be to put yourself out there into groups and communities with these like games and stuff going on. Yeah, fully. I I think that their timing for this as Darrington Press is just incredible. I really am trying not to speak too flowery about it. I think it's good timing. <laughs> Very casually. It's cool timing. Um, Because yeah, yeah. every step of the way, there's just more opportunities for the community to get more engaged. And I really think that this is part of that, you know? Um, So moving on from that, the Faint Divinities, the channel name, I think that's important. Uh, so yeah. because it's being pulled directly out of Daggerheart lore, you know, I was one of those people. It was released on March 12th, two days after my birthday. So thank you very much, Critical Role, Darrington Press, for the late birthday present to me. I loved it. Uh, thank you for assigning homework. Um, <laughs> I, I, But I dove into everything. And right at the very beginning, it starts talking about the different realms of existence, the deep deities, everything like that, that are happening. And um, it was super light, I would say, in terms of lore. I don't know if it's going to build later on, but something that I really liked was there are little hints, little breadcrumbs of the world that they're building. You know, they talk about the earliest age when the gods created the world and then uh, effectively new gods were created and there was a war amongst the deities, at which point three different realms were created. The mortal realm, where all of the mortals mm. exist and probably adventures are going to take place. Then you have the hallows above where the new gods who won the divine war, whatever you want to call it, uh, absconded to, I don't think absconded is the correct word, retired to, however you want to say it. <laughs> they now exist in the hallows Didn't above. Ex there we go. <laughs> yeah. And then they banished any gods who were against them to the circles below, which is a hellscape, you know, um, but there in the mortal realm, there are still some deities. Some of the forgotten gods still seem to exist there. I get like major Sylvanus kinds of vibes, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But also lesser deities that were created by both new gods, forgotten gods alike, called the faint divinities. And I thought that, I don't know, something about that really <laughs> stuck a nerve in my little smooth brain and I had to like think about it a lot I really loved it so um that's we are the name is specifically being pulled from lore for Daggerheart and yeah. uh yeah I like to it's, think of uh, oh go ahead it's it's fun it's not uh anything uh uh too out there and I think it's very focused on what we're trying to do as channel too we're pulling from lore because we're trying to make this a lot more digestible to the newer players that wouldn't necessarily want to have to dig through the uh 300 page document beautiful document by the way some of the art in there lovely oh. the the different uh ancestries and just like all of the stuff throughout is yeah. good stuff again not to flower it too much but um uh, that way we can digest it a bit more and kind of produce it in bite-sized chunks to make people more invested in getting on board with us. Yeah. yeah. We want people playing this game. We want a good, fun community to kind of run with. I know. And it's so exciting to see in the Darrington Press uh, Discord channel and everything, so mm -hmm. many people are just so excited and they're trying to find people to play games with. It feels very much like trying to find a D&D &D table, but even even less, you know, and mm -hmm. so I, if, if people are out there and you are excited about this, but you don't have friends that are doing this and you want friends. I, you know, I, I'm certainly watching everything that comes out on YouTube, on Twitch, anybody who talks about Daggerheart, I am just locked in. So we're just more people that you could be friends with. If you want, you don't have to, but you know, um, 
Okay, so do we want to talk about, because I think that probably people who are going to come in are mostly going to be, or people who eventually might watch this, are going to be people probably with some level of experience in probably Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Do we want to talk about some of the differences, like key differences, big mechanical differences? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely so. There's There are some intense differences that... Uh, could rub certain players the wrong way and uh, make others just giddy with joy, I think. Um, the one that really jumps out to me mechanically-wise <laughs> is the the D12s. Using two D12s instead of a D20, you know, everyone loves their, their, their 20-sided dice, but just uh, I'll be utilizing... honest, when I heard it, I was like... No, I was so sad. Like, no, not 20 critical success. There are still critical successes. It's just different. I did not like it at first. Um, but, you know, that's that's really the key difference is, or I think that's a really good difference, is that in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, you are using a D20, a 20-sided die specifically for rolling. If you roll a 1, it is a critical failure if you roll a 20 it's a natural a natural 20 it's a critical success in this game you are using two d12s it's not as complex as it sounds you're still rolling both of them and adding the sum the difference is that it is adding a different layer of mechanic um, but i think when i first heard about it i did not understand how it was going to function Understanding that you are still adding these two together to get your number, um, so rolling them both, adding any modifiers, that's great. That makes it simplistic. The difference, and you'll notice that I am showing like a darker D12, so 12-sided die, and a lighter D12, is that these are going to represent different things in Daggerheart. Your light one is going to represent hope and your dark one represents fear. The, the skill check is still the same functionally. If you, you add all the numbers together, if you roll high enough, then you pass the check. If you roll under the skill check level, you fail the check. But there's an added mechanical layer, which is that when you roll these two dice, depending on what you roll, in this case, I got a two on my hope die and an eight on my fear die. That means no matter what, even if I succeeded the check, because my fear die was higher, I have now gained for the table fear. Fear specifically is something that goes over to the GM or the Dagger Master, uh, and they get to use that to fuel some of their abilities. The alternative on the flip side is that if you roll, and I'm really hoping that my hope die rolls higher, we're going to pretend that it did. A 10 on my hope die, bless you. <laughs> like, you. Um, <laughs> in that case, if your hope die is higher, then you gain hope as the player, and you get to use that to fuel your abilities. And then there are also layers of kind of helping to guide the GM, I think, in terms of how the role play is going to progress. It gives you details around, uh, thanks people in chat looking out for our Echo stuff, I appreciate you. Um, and hi. Hi. Yeah, hello, welcome. Um, so if you roll with hope uh, or fear, the other piece is that not only is it going to mechanically impact the game, it's also going to help the role play of the game. It's going to help guide the storyline. So I do you think that it's too long for me to give the example that I gave like some of our newer players the other day of the tavern? <laughs> Yeah, um, like the. I mean, I think it's a good example still. Um, simplifying it somewhat would just be running into um, running down an alley and going to dodge uh, something falling as you're trying to escape a villain of some sort or some kind of enemy. Um, if you roll with uh, hope and, and you roll and you succeed. Um, as you slide by, you might slide past this falling debris and then it slam right into the, the uh, person chasing you. Um, versus if you roll 
and you pass with fear, uh, you might slide through, but he might slide right behind you and mm. be like right on your trail. But like neither you nor him were stopped or slowed. Um, if you fail with hope, maybe you know you you get hit, but he trips over you, so he lands on his back in front of you, giving you just enough time to get up and run back in the opposite direction you started from. Um, and then felling with fear means that it probably hits you. And when you get up, he's standing there waiting for you. That's such, I love that. I see, I hear some people being a little bit concerned about this. And I don't know, maybe it's just because I've been GMing for so long. I just feel like it gives me the exact flow to go to, you know? Yeah, it gives you as a DM, because sometimes you want like when someone rolls a negative one, you want to be a little bit uh, more uh, harsh as like a dungeon master to be like, well, then this very negative thing happens. Um, but sometimes it almost feels like either it's not enough or you're being a little too heavy handed with it and it feels unfair to the players. This gives the DM the rubric. Yeah. It's like, okay, they failed, but they didn't fail that bad. So like make <laughs> it something okay. Um or like they succeeded, but they didn't succeed by much. Like, it, it, again, it kind of just helps the DM tell the story a little bit more in rather than them having to come up with like, oh, well, do I want this to happen? Do I want this to happen? Do I want this to happen? That kind of helps you come up with where you want to go. I, yes, I fully agree. I think that it's instead of just being a pass or a fail, Plus a 5% chance on a natural 20 of a pass yeah. with hope. That's what we could call it in D&D 5e, right? Is a right. natural 20 is the pass mm -hmm. with hope. The, the yeah. critical success, although I don't want to tie that. But the neg the natural one, on the other hand, is that bad, bad, lower limit of things. Um, yeah. I think it's really beautiful. I'm really excited about it. Um, the other thing that I do think is really different because you are rolling with two D12s is talking about critical success. Um, so a yeah. critical success in this is not D20. There is no 20 on a D12 on a 12-sided die. It's when you roll two of the same Sorry. It's when your hope and your fear die match. So if you roll doubles mm -hmm. of anything, this happened. I don't know if you were watching it live, but I, I'm almost certain. I hope that I didn't like make this up in my brain. I don't think I did. I'm pretty sure that in the one shot that Critical Role did for Daggerheart, uh -huh. Marisha Ray at one point, if I'm oh. remembering correctly, rolled a critical success but it was ones it was double yeah. ones which is yeah. hilarious because a one in D D fifth is edition bad so sorry for you yeah. what a bad day yeah. to be you my bad but uh -huh. it's oh so funny i love it oh i love yeah. it so much so plus rolling well, doubles I, I, is super fun it's super fun. I mean, it's it's like the Yahtzee feel, like, you know, like yeah. you're, you're having fun rolling dice and when they match up, it's exciting. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's, snake eyes. Exactly. And it, it's it's nice that it, they open it up. It kind of makes it feel like it's more achievable sometimes, um, even though probability-wise, it's, it's probably about the same, maybe a little more, but not much. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well... I also like the... Uh, the go ahead no you're good you're good go i also like the idea of that um critical and just being excited because if you rolled really low but they were the same number <laughs> yeah yeah it's just so funny again those being double ones and it, it resulting in the best success that you can have is so funny to me i really love that um okay what other like differences key differences are there in this specifically oh you know what the stat bonuses do yeah, you want to talk yeah, about that true. so the stat bonuses being different and uh you still have your plus one your plus uh two your your zero your negative ones but you're not necessarily um attributing that to a 15 or a 16 now. The, the 15 doesn't mean that you only have the plus two. And the 16 means that you have the plus three. They've gotten rid of that, that rubric of numbers. 
um, replacing it with just the bonuses. So now you really only have to concentrate on the bonuses, um, which I think is really nice. I also like the the change up of the standard dexterity. Uh, we obviously still have strength. Um, there's no charisma based. Uh, there is that. Uh, well, not not charisma, constitution. Constitution, right. yeah, absolutely, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the charisma's presence. Um, yeah, which is kind of good to me because as as a GM, how often are you using constitution checks unless they're having a drinking contest? That was about to say, where are we at a tavern? <laughs> um, uh, the only other time is like when poisons come poisons. into effect and yeah. like, even that so far and few between, like, are, are we actually concerned uh, with not being able to come up with a, a different kind of metric to judge if someone is poisoned or not? <laughs> yeah, that is a good point, though. What are we going, what would you use? And maybe I've missed it somewhere in the 400 pages that the document is. But what would you use as a GM just on the fly for a poison check? Would you use... I guess it depends on how you use it. Like, are you? I, it, it would it would depend on like if it's something if it's just an attack. Yeah. I just need you to roll two d twelve and tell me the the score, and then I'll have a preset difficulty class. Um, I'm just like so know. excited about rolling them all the time. I only got a six, and there was a one <laughs> on my hope and a five on my fear. It's real bad. Yeah, you had a you had a locked up there and fallen to the ground, maybe twitched a little bit. Oh um, man, not twitching. <laughs> I'm trying to be so cool. Like oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We always want to be cool, but not always. Um but I don't know if I necessarily feel like it's required to necessarily have a uh trait. Real quick. We mm -hmm. have a question in chat, which is for okay. someone who has so many D20s already in my bag, do they ever get to be used? I think you're going to be better suited to answering this maybe, but the answer is absolutely. There are yeah. specific situations where the D20 gets used. First of all, the GM or the dungeon master gets to use the D20 much more frequently, but also... It's their primary dice. The, the dungeon master is not rolling for hope or fear. The dungeon master is hoping for your fear. Yeah. So um, you're still getting as a dungeon master, as, a, as our dagger master, sorry um to uh roll your d20 you're still getting to play around and, and utilize that but yeah no there are um abilities and uh certain uh domain cards which is another interesting thing we'll get into um that require that you roll a d20 to to use them um they're not used as frequently but overall they're still there yeah I know who the person is that asked the question and I appreciate you and you being here and you asking questions. And also, yes, there is a cat. And I know the person who's talking about the cat too. That's Apollo. He's a friend. Oh, yeah. Very exciting. Yeah. yeah. But the answer really is absolutely. There are all kinds of things that allow players to use the D20 less regularly. And I definitely, mm -hmm. I would be lying if I said I wasn't bummed about not getting to use the D20. It really is like, man, do you know how many, it's a great question of like, what do I do with all of my D20s? This is a bag full of like D20s. What do I do with all of them? I mean, on the flip side, perfect excuse to buy more dice because now you need a fear dice and you need a hope dice. These and are brand new, baby. What were you using your D12s for before? You got one with every single set of dice you ever bought, and you might have used it a handful of times. Wow. So it's really just like shaking up the, the whole like structure and everything. So it, it, it's, 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 still, it's still a good time absolutely genius marketing on your part by the way what were you using them for before mm, nothing mm -hmm. now you get to use them every damn time you roll uh -huh. <laughs> like every time every, every time you roll you get to roll two dice there's nothing more fun than rolling multiple dice at the same time being like being able to be like ah and oh on that point, advantage and disadvantage in this game is another interesting and very different feature from standard 5e Dungeons and Dragons. Rather than rolling 2d20s and having advantage or disadvantage, 
you roll your 2d12s and you roll a d6 as well. Um, if you have advantage, you add that d6 to your total. If you have disadvantage, you take that d6 away from your total. And that's another one where, just like what Rachel just showed, now you have your your fear dice is the same color as your disadvantage dice, and your hope dice is the same color as your uh, advantage dice. This game was and, made by Laura Bailey. No, I know it wasn't. Thank uh, you, Spencer but, Stark. But yeah. <laughs> dice goblins rejoice. We do rejoice because we get way more rolls with way more clickety clacks. And wait, um, so many rocks. So many, so many so many fun math rocks and they'll have you sitting there going, Oh, one, uh, two, three, I got a sixteen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I truly like this is it it was not long at all before I was like, Well, mama's gonna need some new dice and I bought like <laughs> two I was like, huh. I need these. These are important now. My shiny rocks, oh no, must must be necessary. But yeah, like I think that's really beautiful as well. Like you said, is use the black or whatever color. You you mm -hmm. should be using probably something darker for a fear mechanic and something lighter for a hope mechanic. But it doesn't well, matter. Well, if, if, you, if you're really talking about it in character creation, one of the things they talk about is maybe mechanically buying some dice that fit your character. Um, you know, they're just trying to sell dice. <laughs> I love that they suggest that, like, I'm not buying a new set of dice for every single character I come to a table with. Every character with. I've ever made, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like, but then, uh, you, you have Sailor that. You Moon have character. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, we use them light dice as fear. I love that. <laughs> yeah, Chris, who is going to be playing with us and has never played it before, uh, as like we were we were little children both who loved collecting rocks and stuff I think he was so excited for the opportunity to need to buy dice and he bought the most beautiful dice I'm really upset about it I want them really badly the, the weird endorphins you get from opening up a new set of dice yeah. is wild yeah um but yeah, no, the, I mean, overall, mechanically, there, there are some pretty heavy differences. I was talking with Rachel uh, just before stream about one of my favorite mechanical differences with this game is the longevity of any weapon that you can own. Um, myself as a player, I, I love roleplay, but I am a combat guy. I do love my combat, too. I want a little bit of it sprinkled in here and there to break up the the good times of role play um but mechanically in this game is you gain proficiencies rather than just adding to what your your bonus is to the hit you actually add to the number of damage dice you're rolling so that family crest sword that you wrote into your backstory uh that you've been carrying and uh want to carry until the end of campaign now becomes a viable weapon to carry to end the campaign as you level up your proficiency, that weapon grows with you. And I think that's so good. I heard someone else speaking about it again. I'm watching everything anybody's talking about Daggerheart with. Um, but I I heard someone else talking about this specifically, and I think it's really important or just interesting that in this, in most games, you fight with whatever comes across your path that is the strongest it doesn't care it doesn't matter if it's the prettiest I, mm -hmm. or not you're a halberd kind of person but all of a sudden hey here's a rapier a little wishy dude that works better and all of a sudden you're a different person i love that your weapon levels up with you <laughs> to me yeah. This is like, you know, when Dungeons and Dr in the player's handbook, they had the ranger class and they had the beast master build and it just didn't work because the your companion, your animal friend did not scale with you and they died as soon as you yeah. had like level eight. They just were yeah. not usable. Of course, they fixed that with unearthed Arc arcana. Like I loved the build that they did later on, you know, but mm -hmm having a weapon that scales with you getting to allow you to keep your favorite weapon what a fantastic fun adventure yeah. i just love and, that. It, and then it, it really does make it a like a more character-based choice of like when you do find that next weapon is like 
is this something that my character would logically want to swap because it's only really there might be a mechanical feature that's added to the weapon that your current weapon doesn't have but if it's not enough to like propel you to like want to lose this weapon that you've been using throughout the campaign you might you not yeah you don't have, you don't have to, to. It, 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 not, you don't have to feel like oh, if i don't use that weapon i'm letting my team down because now i'm not pulling my weight as the fighter or as the barbarian or you know and those uh don't exactly those classes don't exactly exist within dagger heart but versions of them like there's ways to get to them which is uh another fun bit um one of the other key things and and you can see it on on uh the screen you're sharing now is the experience yeah uh, yes. Oh, oh no. I built this character and I'm so sorry that I have awkward risen here. Like yeah. maybe it helps to, to explain <laughs> that I made Jenny a generic <laughs> like character here. And I just wanted to make an easy one. You know me, I'm a melee class through and through. I don't mm-hmm. like to be squishy at all. Can't glass cannon ever. Um, and for the experiences, right? There, there really, there is proficiency in this game, but yes. it's way limited. You know, going back mm-hmm. to what you were talking about with these s- skills, with your actual well, stat. And also, I, like, uh, not to interrupt you, but no, I good. feel like it makes the difficulty class system way easier on the DM because you don't have to like it's mentally true. be like, "Hey, my rogue is going to be able to roll a 30 any time they want to make this specific check um yeah. in this game you can be like a tough difficulty class is 20 yeah and it's viable yeah Asterian trying to unlock like that upper room in act two of Baldur's gate three where the skill check is a 30 you know because yeah, exactly. you can do that at like level eight reliably exactly. you know mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. yeah but for these step For these stat bonuses specifically, for your standard array, you have basically the same items. But again, I also love that it's no longer a big number that means a small number. In D&D 5th Mm. edition, a 10 was a plus zero, and you had to just Mm -hmm. know that. (laughs) And uh, and an 8 was a negative 1, and a 12 was a plus 1. I know that, you know that, but that was intimidating for new players to understand what that meant. And then they all went down to these lower levels of things inside of these skills that you could have proficiency in. So, Mm -hmm. you know, an example of that was if you were doing a strength check, maybe it wasn't a strength check, maybe or presence. Let's use presence instead, because some of these are straight up things that you could take proficiency in in D&D 5th edition, which is you could perform. And performance is something you could have an additional proficiency in in 5th edition. You don't have that here. Your bonuses are your bonuses, but you have this other thing. And this is really where Daggerheart, I feel like, is hitting its stride with what it's talking about. This is where it puts its money where its mouth is. It, yeah, said, it said, we want you to be able to engage in a role-playing game. And it meant that. It was like, you are you are the champion of your own destiny. So you, during character creation, these aren't options that I got to select from inside of the Demiplane app. These are, I decided, okay, what things do I think experiences are really important to this character? And in your head, you're making this backstory. And that she could apply in all different kinds of ways. Well, defender of the weak. And this can mean a lot of different things, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe in combat, one of your healer, your seraph, right? Maybe your, your healer class is there and they are just about to get the wham bam from a big bad. I could potentially use this defender of the weak experience I have to spend hope to do so, but I can yeah. jump in there as my stalwart and I can invoke my experience, Defender of the Week. But it could also be used outside of combat. Say in, an, in a role-playing setting, I see two little kids and this big bully is beating up on them. 
that sounds combaty as well. I can't. Maybe it's a making fun of people instead, not beating up, making fun of people instead. Defender of the week. I can come over and I could use it to persuade them. Hey, you don't have to hurt people to. I don't know why I'm trying to make this therapy, but like yeah. telling this kid, you, yo, bro, let's be nice. Let's be a cool guy. <laughs> like, no reason to be a jerk. Yeah. I'm uh, having yeah, no, totally. Right uh, I've been, I mean, Rachel knows me very well. I'm a character creator. I am, I love making characters through and through. I've made characters for other players before that uh, have never played before. And they're so intimidated by a character creation they just want to tell me their uh, favorite anime character and they kind of want to play just like them. And I go through and I help them out making that character. Um, this character creation has forced me to think more about character creation than I have in a long time because it became so mathematical for me when I was creating it before. And now I really do have to be like, okay, well, yeah, I'm making this um ranger uh this uh, f uh fungal ranger and um i really think that yeah i want him from the woods and i want him to uh be a big game hunter and like something like that is yeah like maybe we're fighting a large creature and i'm like hey i'm gonna try to use my big game hunter experience here um or maybe we've been hired to hunt someone down it's like well, you know, hunting a person isn't that different than hunting down an animal. Maybe I can use some of my big game hunter experience here to track them through the woods, so on and so forth. Um, but it really has made me think about uh, how I want to create these characters. And with the, the new stat system, it gives you examples of agility being sprinting dodging leaping but as a dm if they say they're doing something just like in fifth edition before you can just kind of be like well i think that's closest to this um and you can have them roll and then it's up to the player to be able to say hey i feel like this rely falls back to my experiences that i talked about when we were creating our characters originally um, which which makes it a back and forth between the DM and the player, which is very investing versus having proficiency in uh, perception and walking into a room and being like, what do I see? And it's like, well, I mean, I don't necessarily need to tell you what you see. Your character sees what they see, even with a high perception. You're making this more clinical than it then you would want it to be sometime yeah well i i think that that's part two of what is different in this system is that you're invited as the player to have agency over the game experience and i think that sometimes we all get lost in tabletop rpg of even at very good tables where the GM is not against the players, right? Even right. in this situation, they're the holder of all the knowledge. And sometimes we're almost trained. I certainly am guilty of this. We're almost trained to like force our players to like dig secrets out of what we have. And I think that's fun. I'm not saying that's not fun. You do need a story to unfold, but I do think oh, 100%. there is something like kind of elegant about the way that Daggerheart is asking people to like take ownership of making decisions. And some of that is filtered in through their experiences, you know? So mm -hmm. I am yeah. like, while we're talking, I am in the background making a little Just character kind of here um, based on, together. yeah, exactly. Based on what you had talked about, I'm making a fun guy. He's, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that's one of the differences in this game as well is that, you know, they're not called, they are not races, they are ancestries, which I think is really beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. Because in this, it's very clear, it's pointed in the materials. They say your character could be part of every single one of these ancestries. 
now you are still going to have to choose a mechanic <laughs> like yeah, so yeah, whichever yeah, yeah. one fits for you but they are straight they are not restricting a character behind a race um they basically got rid of languages at this point they were like mm -hmm. everybody speaks the common tongue and i think that might be trying to make it a more inclusive experience um, well yeah because that's another thing they talked about as well because like beyond just like everyone speaking the common tongue um, they even mentioned that it, uh, in the playtest material that with as far as going with like people that might be um, deaf or mute um, or any of those types of things, uh, sign language is well known across like uh, uh, the continent yeah. or like the world as a whole. Hundred um, percent. Um, Rooks in chat, who is our moderator, and also his name is Chris, and he'll be playing with us soon. Uh, said Daggerheart does seem a lot less like a simulator than D and D, which is dope, but maybe can be tough in less direction. So like having less direction, I would say. What do you think about that? I agree with that. I think that it does it does put some more agency on your DM to kind of be able to wrangle a table. Oh, um, yeah. I, I've definitely sat at some tables before and, uh, you know, it's always a blast having the guys that are, you know, just cutting up or the group that's just having so much fun. They want to talk and like kind of cut away from the game for some side conversations and stuff. Um, when you don't have a very like sharp direction, that's easy to happen. So with it being so broad, like I said, I, I, it does put some agency on to the DM to to keep the story motion moving, uh, to keep the players interacting with the story, which I think uh, it goes into one of the things they talked about in the play, the play material as well, um, that it is very back and forth. It needs to be consistent. It needs to be constant. Players need to be passing essentially the mic back and forth to each other so everyone has an opportunity to kind of describe what they're doing in the scene that the dm has painted um and then the dm from taking all that in just like any tabletop game has to come up with something um i Ooh, with, sorry. without it having as much of like a rubric it can be a little daunting um now I do feel like play DMs like me and you that have done it before, it's not going to be much harder than what we already deal with. Uh, I honestly, can I, I love what you're saying. I totally agree. But rebuttal to that also, you know, uh -huh. um, have you GM'd those tables where the players aren't playing the game because they're just not invested at all? They like lose focus and you're constantly, I think I've heard a DM, a, a GM, whatever, at one point, that was a DM. He was a dungeon master. He said at one point that the best experiences that he has at table are when the players start role playing and talking about stuff amongst themselves and are not looking to the GM because that's when it feels real. I've had that experience so often as not a ton, but as a GM before of you build this thing and the people aren't engaging with it. And sometimes it feels like it's just because they don't know what to do. Um, yeah. I think Daggerheart might have an opportunity to shift that a little bit because it's giving, again, I keep saying it, but agency to the players to create the world around you. I was reading um, or maybe listening. I don't know. I'm consuming so much Daggerheart right now. But somebody said in one of their plays that they started walking through a forest and the player, I think maybe a ranger or something, was describing the forest and they said Oh, and, you know, the trees are all of these different rock formation trees and stuff made of different gems. And the D, the GM then got to utilize that to make a different encounter in that forest it, and made it like a petrified forest and like this experience of something like dying. And I think that's really cool for that. I think I, I, I don't think I considered that kind of aspect of it but that is honestly super awesome like having the players kind of develop their environment not just like what's happening within it well also like the 
players, this is something that I think about a lot of the time is I think sometimes, you know, the best players to me a lot of the time are the ones, and I'm going to ruffle some feathers here, but are the ones who want to write a lot of backstory. Sometimes GMs hate that. I think it's so exciting to see someone who's excited about a, a character. I get not doing it. I'm totally fine with that. But a person who's really invested in the story builds this beautiful backstory and then they come and they sit at a table and they're told what is happening around them. I right. think that right. player is going to love this. I know? think so too. I, I, I can't, I can, I can agree with that for sure. I think the players that are going to have the most difficulty coming over to this are the ones that want the DM to hold their hand through the process and, Hold their hand seems kind of rude, maybe, but um, they do. They they want the DM to to tell them. Like I said, when they walk in the room, make a perception check. They want the DM to tell them if they found a secret door. Yeah. Like. Yeah. <laughs> they they don't want to come up with the idea of like, well, you know, as I was kicking around this room, I moved this desk, and maybe there's something here. Um, and like, kind of like looking towards the DM to be like could I have found something here? Is this a place that I could have? And then that gives the DM the opportunity to be like, oh, you know what? You find a secret compartment, not necessarily a room, but a compartment with um, maybe some vials of dried up uh, essences of some sort. And that kind of keys the players into uh, some kind of big bad that might have been there 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, something like that. Yeah. Um, so just as a note, the story. yeah, absolutely. So time check, project manager brain, we're like 45 minutes in. So, <laughs> so <laughs> okay, we've okay, been, okay. we've been, because we're just talking. That's my favorite thing yeah, about this are. is it really yeah. just gets to be two GM friends who are excited and talking. But I think that I do want to talk about, um, so we've talked about a lot of the key differences. We're not going to be building a full character today. Um, yeah, we're... there's going to be a show for that. We, we, we want to have an episode um, beyond just our session zero or the players themselves. We're going to be getting to like talk about our characters. Me and Rachel want to, to do a, a, like a paper copy for a character creation and then maybe another show where we do the the demi bane uh demi plane creation of a character um so we, we have, have a, time go yeah, ahead we have a question um so this oh. is coming from care bear dare which i love that name great name um mechanically mostly as a dm but also as a player how compatible is dagger heart with other rpg resources i have a bunch of 5e fifth edition pathfinder and older edition resources with neat monsters and features and i'm curious how much work it would take to for example transfer over a stat block so I can certainly answer this to you, I think, might be able to answer a little bit with monsters, or maybe we can investigate that a little bit better. I can start with characters and say that I have, as part of what I've been doing, I've been pulling a lot of characters into this new system, and uh, I would say it's pretty easy. You're going to find that... Daggerheart is certainly taking inspiration from other thematic items. For example, I was really bummed if we go into, you know, Demiplane here. I was really bummed that I wasn't finding a barbarian. I know barbarians are kind of hard role play wise sometimes of like the rage concept. But actually, if you look at the guardian option and you go into, I believe specifically it's the stalwart, if I remember correctly, you will find that inside of that, there are all of these things that read as a respect barbarian. It's not a barbarian. Yeah. They don't have yeah. rage, but it's similar, you know? Yeah, very much so. Um, it, it, it is easy enough to take a character that maybe you've played and you just want to kind of revamp for a new system to see how they play through that system um, creation-wise. As far as like monsters and such, it's not super difficult. You just have to essentially get used to the uh, the hit points uh, thresholds, which it's is is, so is, is another 
major difference. And um, I, I, I'll talk about that right now because that'll kind of explain the, the major difference there between swapping a monster over that you might have from 5e to the system. Um, rather than having a set amount of hit points, you don't necessarily have 69 hit points or 120 hit points or so on and so forth. Um, you have hit point marks. So um, within there, those can grow as you level to become a, a, a fair amount. Um, I think it's up to 12. Yeah, it's, I think, where it maxes out for their current system. Um, you have thresholds to the amount of damage that you're going to actually um, be taking. So if me as the DM takes a creature and I hit you um, damage-wise and like mechanical-wise there, that stuff translates pretty one-to-one -one overall. There's going to be some major differences maybe with like breath weapons and stuff, but... Um, well, there are there are breath weapons in this also. Just... Yeah, yeah. And then they have some like already pre-existing to kind of give you an idea of like, okay, this is this to this, and then you can kind of play around with it that way. Um, but the thresholds is going to be your major thing. So your weaker creatures, their thresholds aren't going to be as strong as like your dragons and your like uh, beholders and things like that. Um, with the thresholds, there's different thresholds for different classes as well. So um, I think you're looking at which class is this that you're looking at? This is at the here? Seraph. The Seraph. So the, the, and you can see right under where it says hit points and uh, stress that starts at 5 for minor, 10 for major, and 15 for severe. Um Assigning those, I think, will be kind of... Is... Go ahead, go ahead. I, I think assigning those is going to be the most interesting part of kind of bringing a ex pre-existing monster over to the new system. I haven't gotten to do a lot of that yet, uh, just because I'm aiming up as a player right now, and then I'm going to be switching over to DM, so I haven't gotten into the monster aspect of it quite as much as I want to. Yeah, I, I'm going to say also this conversation is too big. Like this is like this specific hit points and threshold and armor and damage. It's, it's, we don't have so enough much. time today yeah. to dive into that. <laughs> That's if you want to talk about the biggest complexity in terms of coming to the table as a new player, I'm going to say it's this. We will talk about that separately. But Care Bear Dare, I, which again, fun name, I would say generally speaking as well because of who the people the creators of this are which they are specifically a group who want flexibility and stuff i'm seeing a lot of easy ways to translate stuff over and yeah. i think that they're seeking to build more and more stuff in that makes it compatible full transparency i don't know if this is their goal but the Critical Role cast who play in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, they are the same organization that has released this. And there is a lot of curiosity behind the question mark of when they start a new campaign, will they be doing it in this dagger heart system and i think there's a really good chance that it will and so you can really see that they are digging in to try to make it a seamless transition i think you're going to find that things are going to translate over easily because yeah. that's their core audience um mm -hmm. and so i don't think that that's going to be an issue you can in point of fact even go on to critical roles uh, YouTube at this point and you can see them build a character that was in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition and just recycle them into Daggerheart. It's so yeah. um, probably for those specific items that you're talking about those like features and those details it would depend on what it was specifically but I would bet good money that it's gonna be you're gonna be able to put it into this game realistically you'll have to retool it just like anything else but yeah okay um all right so i again we're and we're just you know i knew that we were gonna planning on going one two two hours so we're good to you know but we're yeah. at like an hour now so i'm having so much fun i've been I wanting to talk about this so much 
We've it's been so like holding be back to... a little, mm -hmm, you know, because mm -hmm. we knew this was because, coming. Exactly. I knew this was coming. So there's certain things I haven't talked about. Um, Can we talk uh, about them now? I want to talk about the things we're really excited for. I, you go because I'm going to get too excited about about fastball special. So, so um, I am really excited about and like we won't get into it too deeply, but the whole um, evasion armor class feature that oh, they're doing. Yeah, yeah. I, I again, I'm more interested in uh, not necessarily more interested. I would say that I'm probably about 50 50 on my role play to battle. Um, I love them both equally for different reasons. Um, <laughs> Both of my children, and I simply I could it. not choose. I could not choose. You, if you told me I had to go to a table without one or the other, it would probably hurt my feelings, but I'd still probably go. Um, it's giving major dad <laughs> energy. You're like, these are my babies. Do not take the armor class away from me. <laughs> go ahead. I do love it. Yes, yeah. Um, but in this game, evasion is is your armor class so like when you're thinking about uh your armor class from dungeons and dragons evasion is like the number your dm your uh, dagger master needs to roll to even hit you um which is always like it's it's different in the idea of thinking about describing how your character because it is evasion how your character is dodging these hits so like as the DM is like, and then the skeletal monster swings their axe, and I rolled a 14, and your evasion's a 15. I miss how, like, explain how that happens. Mm -hmm. It's like if you're playing with, like, uh, one of the Samians, like one of the, the, the monkey folk or whatever, um, maybe you reach up and with your tail whip around their axe and spin around to dodge out of the way. Um, mechanically, there's nothing in this game saying you can't do that and then land on the side behind him because there's not initiative order. Like, yeah. it, it is all kind of built in at the same time, so it's very much, like, give and take, give and take. Um, and then the idea of the armor, because you have your health points that you're not wanting to lose because there are less of them, so in theory, it could be easier to die. <laughs> um, Wait, what? <laughs> so, because you oh, have... Oh, I'm know. so sorry. I thought you... I, yes, it might be easier to end up dead. I thought you were saying it might be easier just to choose death. And I was like, okay, well, listen. Oh, no, like, no, 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 no. I, I like, have mechanically looked at it and said sometimes it might be easier for oh, a character just to say, I do nothing. I'm like, scared. Because, yeah. <laughs> I'm scared of uh, that. But the, the armor taking away damage to lower those thresholds. Like, that's another cool mechanic. It, like, makes your armor beyond just, like, being, like, I have this super heavy plate armor that, like, I can take hits in. But even if, like, my enemy's rolling over 100, um, they're still going to hit me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think I like the armor as well because it's a usable function in this mm -hmm. game. Armor class was always just like this thing that you equip to yourself just for a number. In this, it has role play mechanics. Mm -hmm. You use your armor. You mar If you use it, you mark off a use of it. If you get to those full three items, that it breaks and you can you have to repair it and that's a downtime activity which brings me to i'm not going to talk about it yet i'm i'm only going to bring up two but my first favorite item specifically is downtime i love the activities that they have mm -hmm. so in t tabletop rpg at the end of an adventuring day right you have to sleep you have to rest um and a lot of the time there are items where you can do certain things when you perform a long rest or a short rest in dungeons and dragons fifth edition for example sometimes you might get to do certain things twice until you take a short rest and then you can do it again and at a long rest you recharge all of your spells this game doesn't work as much of that because the mechanics fueling your abilities are those hope and fear items that we talked about previously but in dungeons and dragons fifth edition and other tabletop rpgs that i've played before there's not really a good answer of what can i do at a short and long rest or sorry that are outside of that 
not only are there specific answers to that question here, but they also fuel the role playing. And I love it. I'm so excited about it. Look, mm -hmm. during a short rest, for example, you have the option to do two of these items. If your armor is broken, then you can repair your armor. Um, but you could also, and it doesn't restore all of it during a short rest, but you could also, for example, prepare to get a new hope. During a long rest, I don't want to make the joke that I made, but fine. You can clear <laughs> stress, you know, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to clear all marked stress. Oh, my goodness. My best friend is in chat. You could tell because she's the one complimenting me. Um, <laughs> love you, doll. Anyway, <laughs> um, so you could de-stress de -stress, um, <laughs> during a long rest, uh, but... If you notice, all of this specifically says how you are going to do it is part of that. You don't just get to say, or I'm sure at certain tables you'll be able to, but at my table, oh. I'm going to need to know how you're clearing stress. Are you zenning out in front of a river? What's happening? You know, because it says specifically, uh, describe how you patch yourself up. You can choose to do this to an ally instead. What a beautiful moment that you're sitting there and you're tending to the wounds. You're salving, I'll say LV, salving, and a wound <laughs> on a character or something, and and also, I promise this is the last of this, but work on a project. Steven, you know that I made up a bad mechanic for this in our home game. It, it, it I, worked. It, I mean, kind of. Like, <laughs> I did. Uh, yeah. But working on a project... I see this so much as, I'm going to say the words again, a love letter from Matt Mercer's brain. And I'm sure it's not just that. There are so many people who like this kind of thing. I think it's a Pathfinder mechanic, if I'm right, working on a project. I can't remember. But basically, you as the player might have a very interesting idea. And this goes a little bit back to the question we had earlier about how flexible is the system. Very flexible. In including this say that your character uh, is an inventor pulling from critical role campaign one and you want to make a new kind of weapon like a gun you could work on a project uh, during your long rests and the GM gets to ask for a role to determine how long is this going to take. So, for example, if you said, I want to make a gun, I might say, that sounds like something really, really complicated. I'm going to decide that you're going to roll a D20 for it. You might have a maximum of 20, but maybe you get to make it really fast. And then you roll a D20 and, oh, I rolled a nat 20. Oh, man. If I roll my D12s, will I get a critical success? Let's see. Literally no. Literally no. And my hope is lower. <laughs> it's not good. Um, but I rolled a nat 20 and that, wow, what an exciting thing. That's still good for me as a GM. But anyway, um, so in that case, it would be, okay, well, you are going to have to take 20 long rests to actually develop that gun. Um, but you could feasibly do it. I love this downtime stuff. I love that they say it represents moments of respite. <laughs> What? What happened? Sorry, the chat. The chat. Oh, I, uh, <laughs> I'll get a I'll get a top down camera. I have to anyway because I'm going to do like actual oh, maps yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. But but yeah, Please, like I don't know if I will. <laughs> I don't. I I mean like have trust. <laughs> I have I trust feel, as well can, for sure. Yeah, really I mean I guess, but I but my camera ain't gonna do that. Okay, it's just a Nat <laughs> from Amazon. But anyway, uh, but that was a Nat twenty. There's no reason for me to lie about this. I'm not in a game. Trust me. Anyway, um, so that that is one thing I'm excited about. You go, and then I will say the thing that I want to talk about. But you go. Um, and I kind of talked about it earlier, but some of the domain cards, like I, it, it's mm. the, the domain, like idea of the domain deck is so interesting because it takes should you game... introduce the domains just the concept yes. a little yes. bit I, I, I would love to so each class um has two domains in most classes uh throughout the different uh sets will share certain domains but the domains are actually um more of like 
how they function in in what they're doing. So she's looking here, uh, and serif. I'm actually not. Is that one of the serif domains? These are but serif. I'm not sure if that's or, uh, order or. Oh um, oh um I'm so sorry. Let's see. Uh, these are splendor level splendor, ones, and okay. these are valor level ones. Yeah. And so like uh, I know that splendor is something that both the serif, which is like your cleric class. Um, and I want to say the, um, Druid, because the Druids are your, one of your healer classes as well. Yeah, I, I don't remember. I mean, it is in here specifically, but like the domains are in here and I don't think it actually says which ones I would have to find it, but the Splendor specifically is the domain of life. So it would make mm -hmm. sense that it might have to do with, um, with the druid as well but i don't remember off the top of my head and, and each one is a domain like that so like domain of life domain of um, nature there's one for knowledge there's one for like night um uh yeah. there's like the one the the bard one which is uh, i want to say is grace they yeah. have grace mm -hmm. and codex i remember mm -hmm. these specifically from best friend stuff yeah <laughs> um bone is one that i like a lot it's, it's gonna be your more uh you you see that one with your ranger and your warrior class which is like you're like they're tac ta they're tacticians again i i like the fighty bits um <laughs> but but they really are the idea of these domain cards takes this game and kind of turns it into a tabletop slash card game in a way um it does I later that on too. like er early on you're only going to have a handful of domain cards um but later on you'll have quite a few and in a short rest you can switch out your domain cards um which can really like if you are about to go in and do something and you know hey i have a domain card that's in my deck but not like on my because uh, i think you can only have two domain cards active at once I'd have to look that at lower I'm levels. Not, not that's a, lower level lower thing. Levels. Yeah. At, at lower levels. It's, I yeah. think it's a maximum of five at level 10 is as high okay. as the levels go right now. But, but at level 10, you should have like 20 domain cards. So, um, cause I think you get two domain cards each level. Yeah. Um, and you switch them out. This, I think I could be wrong. I don't know how familiar others will be, but Darrington Press, who again are affiliated with Critical Role and built this, they have been putting out other stuff for a while now and yeah, they put yeah. out Queen by Midnight. It is a really cool board game and it specifically mm -hmm. has, just like a lot of card games, you have essentially a hand of cards and then other items and you get to swap items into your hand to use them. It's an interesting mechanic. This game feels like it's pulling from tabletop RPG, board games, card games, video games, and merging it into this just beautiful monster i'm really loving yeah. it yeah yeah um I, i'm really excited to actually get into the game i'm excited for us to to have our session zero for us to play our game and i'm excited for this conversation afterwards too to really kind of see you know the change between what we're talking about now versus in three weeks four weeks when we have that one we could be more talking about like our actual experiences which is going to be super exciting yeah, it's a really um, different kind of conversation. Maybe we hate it. <laughs> yeah, may, maybe, you know, uh, we haven't actually Said, gotten a chance to play it game. yet. So, <laughs> yeah, um, unfortunately, I'm biased, and I, I'm always like, give everything a few chances before you quit it. But uh, yeah, true. Uh, the domain cards are super exciting. It's just, it's a fun way to change up spells. It's a fun way to change up, like, your feats and abilities that you'd be receiving within the game. Um, Can I add some context to this also? Yes, yeah, go right ahead. So you've said that this is one of the things you really like are the domains. These are, again different abilities that you can take each level um mm -hmm. you have different options depending on your class so 
like I said, I believe that the maximum is five that you can have, but you might have 20 cards at level 10. Something mm -hmm. I absolutely love is that, you know, at Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, how stressful it is. And those of you in chat who play Dungeons and Dragons and have ever been like a druid or, or what's another class that gets to pick your spells every single day? Um, um, cleric. Cleric. Oh, my God. Cleric. My sweet, sweet war clerics oh rest in peace um they every day you get to decide what spells from my list of 50 am i taking today i only get to pick 12 and then yeah. you go out into the world and if you really needed a specific spell like daylight that day but you didn't pack it sorry you're sol that's that's <laughs> on you man you should have yeah. known there were gonna be vampires here and sometimes uh -huh. you just don't listen do you i don't know if you know this yet it's super I, sick i do i do with your domain cards you have your hand you have your reserve but mm -hmm. if at any point you want to take a different one because oh my god you need that daylight spell or let's say it here right you know, like, now. Let's, let's look at one of the other ones at a very high level i'm so i'm scrolling very fast but let's say that you absolutely need winged sentinel wait that's um, no, the that's, subclass, that's a, yeah, that's a subclass. <laughs> i'm so sorry go, let's... go up one more go up one more Let's say, smile. Yeah, right there, right there, Here we right go. There, perfect. Let's yeah. say that you're a seraph. You've chosen something else, but right now you know that one good smite is going to absolutely knock this bad guy out. You can choose to take this card out of your reserves and into your hand, even though you didn't prep or pack it, and you have to exert yourself. You have to pay this cost, which I believe is stress. stress. I believe you it mark is. two stress to get this into your hand so absolutely sick that you don't have to hate yourself for not packing the thing that changes the game you yeah, just the, have a different thing that you pay <gasps> yeah, rejoice never everyone never table playing as like a warlock or playing you know and especially like the classes where you have to wait until you level to change your spells and you're like oh i chose a spell i'm gonna love it two sessions in you're like i'm never going to use this spell until i hit level six yeah. and then i'm going to change it out and never look at it again 100%. um and then you're stuck until that next level at least like with like the clerics and the the druids you get the like next day oh i hated that i'm not using that again um so this is so so cool that you idea mean sleet storm of, like <laughs> just like man i really 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 want to uh smite this guy and i'm not completely tapped on my stresses i'm gonna smite this guy mm -hmm. yeah it's it's sick all right i know that i added so much context there but it is my turn it and is it... your turn i'll let you have it no no no, no. not even in that way i'm just i'm just <laughs> saying i'm I'm ready if you are to talk about the thing that I'm here to talk about. And I really wanted to find where it was in this huge sheet, but I just, oh, maybe if I look at, oh, you know what, is it in combat? Because I'm going to talk about my absolute favorite thing in this whole new system. Probably not, but the uh... thing that I'm really excited about. I want to find the combat section. Um, so uh, my favorite thing specifically is... No, 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 no man. You're good, you're good. If you find it, let it. me know. But it's, it's called the tag team mechanic or something, mm -hmm. I believe. It is... And again, I'm still looking for it. I'm going to try to find it. Uh, I thought that it would be in combat, but I just can't remember it. I didn't find it before here. Um, so tag team specifically is what I call fastball special. And it <laughs> specifically <laughs> is a thing that everybody wants to do inside of, of, of tabletop RPG, which is you want to invoke the awesomeness that is video game combat. My first video game ever, 
it was Chrono Trigger for the Super Nintendo. Um, and inside of that, which is a role-playing game, you had the ability for all of the characters to start one attack and then the other person, another or up to three, could all merge together to do a super-powered attack, you know? Like, Chrono would be spinning with his blade and Leah, Leia threw fire onto it and it was Flame Blade. That's what this is, is that this game wants you to be the master of your own destiny. And so it says specifically that there is this ability that each player can initiate once per session or long rest. I can't remember. It's session. It's session. Session. And specifically, when you do it, you get to describe how your characters work together. When I say that this game is pulling from all of these different rubrics, that this is a mixed material kind of game, this is a video game thing that I have not played a system that has. I'm sure I will be stand I will stand corrected at some point but I'm so excited for this fastball special by the way is specifically the mechanic where uh it happens a lot at tables if you have a large character and a small character is usually the way that you do this um so like a uh, a in this game a giant and a halfling that giant takes the halfling and throws them at the enemy and they come in swinging and usually the gm gets to add a little flavor advantage on it because it's a cool thing or maybe you pummel an additional d6 or something of damage into it but the fact that that is built into dagger heart is my favorite i want to see <laughs> magic spells that have this in place if my players do not bring some prepared fastball specials i'm going to absolutely lose it it is what i'm here for i'm so excited i'll have to make sure to get with uh kayla and chris to go and work some of that stuff out please um, i want it so bad i'm so um, excited about to this to be clear she said giant picking up half leg it isn't always the throwing scenario it is just um uh, teamwork battling. It's teamwork. So, it's teamwork. Yeah, so, sure. So, sure, sure, sure. Uh, well, you, you know, you're, you're there, you have a shield, your other teammate runs and you oh, yeah, that... them up uh. into the air and then they'd shoot from up high to get like the headshot. It's, like, it's Aragorn throwing stuff. Gimli, you know, exactly. across. Yeah, yeah. Don't it, tell it is, the elf. It, so much you can do with it. It is one of the mechanics that we kind of, we talked about a little bit at the beginning with rolling for hope or rolling with hope and gaining hope um it requires three hopes to do so it's not something that is uh uh necessarily like a free thing to do once per session you have to have three hopes and you have to be set up for something um it's so exciting it is it is an exciting kind of Again, it, it it's exciting for me the idea of this like very loosey goosey initiative. It's it is the players being cognitive of not, and this is something that it happens on games, and it's not ever like anyone has like this idea in their head that uh, they're going to outshine in a certain scene but you have to be more cognitive about the people that you're playing with as far as like being uh, able to pass the torch so i've done my three actions maybe i now like say as i'm finishing my final sword attack or whatever it is that i've done in this in this combat um i bring up the fact that i slide in and i uh, slide next to one of my allies, leading them to like be able to like come in swinging next or blasting magic or whatever it is they're doing. I um, found it. It's called a tag is. team roll. I think that's the. Tag oh team. my gosh! I I'm yeah. so excited. It's called a tag team roll, you guys, and I'm obsessed with it. Each player can choose one time per session to mm -hmm. spend three hope. Uh, and remember, mm -hmm. hope are things that you will be accruing throughout the game. You have a maximum of five at any right. given time, so you want to yeah. be spending these as a player. But you yeah, can spend no three hope. Them. Mm, yes, exactly. Just like a Barbarian's Rages, you spend these. Mm -hmm. But you can spend yeah. three hope and initiate a tag team move with another player character, PC. When you do, work with your chosen partner to describe how your two characters combine their actions in a unique and exciting way. Both you and your 
partner make separate action roles, but before resolving the role's outcome, choose one of the roles to apply for both of your results. So you get to, it's basically advantage, but two player advantage, you know, like somebody gets to choose stuff. And if you're a tag team on an, an attack role, if you tag team on an attack role and it succeeds, you both roll damage as usual, then add it together to determine the damage dealt. It's incredible. It is powerful. It is thematic, huge, heavy role play implications. Yeah. I will not stop I, talking I about don't, this. I don't know. If, I, I feel like I, I feel like I talked to you about it before we started the stream. But in that idea of like that heavy damage, it just made me think of it again. But the critical damage in this game. Yeah. I, I was telling telling Rachel earlier. I sit at the table currently, and we we do critical damage this way. But it's so so smart. Um, when you roll and you do a critical hit in combat, um, you take the sum total of the dice you would have rolled, you make that maximum. So if you're rolling 2d8, um, you would just take a flat 16 because that's what you'd have two eight-sided dice hitting eight. You'd take that 16, and then you would add the additional 2d8 that you rolled to it, um, which just, it really makes those criticals feel so much more impactful. It makes it feel like, when you hit that critical that you can describe how awesome this is and it's going to be awesome versus when you're rolling and it's like you roll you roll double damage dice which sounds great in theory but then you roll your 4d8 and three of them are ones and one of them's a two you just did five damage and it doesn't feel very critical <laughs> it guarantees big hits and I think that's really beautiful I had not heard of that before but what a good solution to the problem of a critical not feeling critical you know yeah. Can, like you honestly yeah, sometimes you, you get a critical with your dagger as a rogue and you're like fantastic I don't have sneak attack I did two mm -hmm. damage. Thank you, exactly. everyone. Have a good night. Like, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. so sad. I played too many rogues. But... Um, now, we are getting to close to an hour and a half, so I, I would like us to kind of get into some of the negatives that we might be feeling about yeah. uh, Dagger Heart. Yeah. Um, and I can I can launch right off because we're coming, we're talking about combat right now. Yeah, for sure. Um, my concern and it's the one kind of not necessarily red flag but it's the one flag that's popped up for me um is the ranges within combat so yeah. theater of the mind is something that's super fun and super like interesting to try to do um, but with this new range system that they have in place it, it is a little bit more difficult to kind of picture that so you have your your up close melee range where you're hitting someone that's right on top of you and it's super easy to understand. Um, you have your uh, very close range, which is the width of the card. Um, I found my wallet happens to be the exact size of their cards. So essentially, this right here is your very close range. Yes, yeah, the top, the short end of it. Um, this is your far range, which is a pencil, about six inches, a pen or a pencil. Um, about six inches is your very far, and, um, is your far range. And then your very far is the length of a sheet of paper, which when you're sitting at a table and you can hold those items up to kind of measure that, I feel like that is something that, uh will be easier to kind of achieve as far as like actually measuring those distances out. But um, theater the mind wise, it, uh, I, I just, it feels like it's going to be a little difficult for some people to kind of wrap their head around. I agree. I really, I feel like I'm going to be honest. I think that it is not really intended to be used very much. Maybe I'm I don't completely so wrong. I don't, I, think... I don't think so either. But I, and, but that again is a negative to me as a as a, as a combat player. I know. I, enjoy I feel that my too. Combat. I um, love. Like, I do my love my role feet. play. Mm -hmm. I love to be like, okay, well, 
I can move this far and the just like the gratification you get for being able to move 35 feet because you're you were a wood elf um, and you got there just because you had that extra five foot of movement is like awesome um, this game throws all that out it doesn't tell you what your movement is it tells you that roughly in a situation of combat you can move very far which is your six inch measurement which, if you're looking at it as a uh, metric of fives, that would be your 30 foot, you know? Uh, inch square is pretty standard for what you play on for uh, character tokens and things like that. I, I agree. I'm absolutely concerned about it. I heard somebody make the joke of like somebody pulls out a pencil and it's like have you ever sharpened that or it's like is that a is that yeah. a standard issue number two uh -huh, because it's uh -huh. like okay but that's where it is kind of loosey-goosey i do get that the idea behind what they're doing is these are things that you're very likely to have at play at your table right you're likely mm -hmm. to have a card and you're likely mm -hmm. to have a sheet of paper so mm -hmm. i think that this they're trying to find a way of explaining things that kind of makes it unnecessary to have a protractor a thing that yeah. i literally <laughs> have brought to like right. games before because of you know uh, area effects and I think that that really does also illustrate one of the big changes that they're trying to invoke here which is I like some of the community I will be honest I don't fully agree with this take but a lot of the community is saying this system's not crunchy it's lightly crispy cute cute don't really agree because I don't know if I agree with that. because of the stuff that's going to go into calculating health, calculating stress, stress, calculating your different armor classes, your armor class, your evasion, your different stress or sorry, thresholds. I'm getting myself turned around. Plus mm -hmm. monitoring your hope. You know, we were looking at yeah. it in a bard cl class at the beginning of a session has to remember to roll or I think place a D6 on their one side on their table and each side that they accrue each time they accrue a hope they increase it by one and when they get to the end of that they can rally their team that's fun and complicated you know that's it, fun it, it means you have to watch like it you means that you have to pay attention um i think that i think another thing that's kind of interesting and not necessarily a negative but um, and this, and they might extend past this later on. Is the the ten level bats? Yeah. Um, as as a as a person that loves and and Rachel can talk about it. I, I love making my characters, but I like kind of doing it in an awkward way. I build me a level twenty character and I roadmap it backwards so I can have a pretty decent idea of where I want to go as I level my character up. Some things might change because of story points or things like that, but I have a fairly good idea of how I'm making my characters. I kind of tried to do that here, and because of the new experiences and things like that, it, it is not as easy. Um, it's doable, but you kind of leave a lot more open than you did on a normal character sheet in 5e. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I don't know how it's going to work out. I'm a little bit, but, okay. On to a thing that I'm a little bit concerned about is in Dungeons and Dragons you have as the GM you are God um, and I don't necessarily love being God but I do love not having to be responsible for my decisions um, I don't really know how to explain that any further except to you know just kind of clarify that when you are dungeon master you can make anything happen at any time within the parameters of play so the the game uh abilities and things so your monsters still work in very much that way combat specifically right you're going to have a turn the way that role-playing game combat works you go in order this game doesn't have that there is no initiative order player characters get to act as many times as they want in no order so 
that's great because it's so flexible. If a druid is like, I am in the forest, I see vines, I do this, and then while they're held by the vines, I'm casting this spell. Fantastic. That's incredible. But they can just do everything. And there is no limit. It is very specific. There's no limit to the number of actions they can take and any single person can take. I've heard one criticism of people being like, this is going to encourage main character syndrome and people. My argument with that is always two things. Number one, find a better table. (laughs) <laughs> or, or talk to that player specifically. Yeah. But number two, GM agency of shutting that down, saying, okay, I, I love what you're doing right here, but you have acted twice. Can we see if someone else is ready to have a turn? You know, mm-hmm. uh, it, it feels a little kindergarten y, but it just is kind of the way that things have to go sometimes. Um, yeah. But my concern is not there. My concern is the mechanic of how a dungeon master gets to play and act. During that process, any fear, remember we've said that the hope fuels player abilities, fear fuels GM abilities sometimes, and it seems like especially in combat. Um, So not only do you get to use your fear that have accrued, the number of fear that have accrued over the course of play, you also as players act, you're going to accrue action tokens and all of that fuels your ability to jump in and take attacks and things. I really hope that it pans out correctly and that it is balanced. I'm concerned because it takes two of the action tokens for the GM to do an action, right? To, to take a turn if I'm right? Yeah. I could be wrong. No, I, I, be- I believe you're correct because you uh, essentially... The way the game is like produced is you have your action card where as the players are performing actions, you're putting tokens on, and yeah. then that way you can kind of keep track because it, it could, without there being agency of like a, an operation order of what, who people are doing what and what order, um, it could quickly get out of hand. Yeah, I, um, I have to remember, I have to bear in mind that that's, it's not abnormal because in an initiative order, if you have five players at table, five players get actions before the, the GM does. But my brain yeah. goes, because you get to invoke and add additional people depending on the number of points that you mm-hmm. have at your disposal. I have to keep that in mind. Um, but I, I am concerned. I am concerned to see how it happens. Um, on the flip side of that, I, you know. uh, uh, with that concern, like I'm excited, <laughs> um, I'm excited to watch you do it first. Yeah, <laughs> sick. Um, sick. You know, <laughs> just out of a, out of deep love, um, deep within my heart. That's the um, sad I, thing I, here I, is that you're yeah. actually a better combat strategist, and I'm going to have to go up against you. And if Justin plays, I don't know, Justin, if you're out there, but if I have to go up against you and Steven in combat initially. Uh, it, y'all are gonna have to be super chill, but I really do want y'all to do those tag team roles. So it's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it'll be a good time. Uh, overall, with us having new people play with us that first time, um, uh, you know, I'll take my elderly DM uh, GM position and dagger master dm dagger always master. means dagger master to be clear yeah, anytime guys. we say it, anytime we say it is dagger master dagger master uh, game master it's, it's, or dagger master <laughs> dagger master just sounds so cool sounds um great. i love it but you know I, I, i'll pull back from my shenanigans because we're teaching people yeah like it's fun to show off a shenanigan you might get one or two but <laughs> Um, overall, like it's it's the teaching aspect that I'm excited about for these next few Me sessions. Me too, yeah. yeah. Because you know, going back to our circling back to the beginning of this discussion and everything, Stephen and I grew into Dungeon Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition together. And one of the avenues that I remember because I was just so gung ho so quickly, and I know that the first game I played at Adventurers League, I walked into an epic where you have all these different tables striving to meet the same goal, and I brought a level one. Character 
character and I knew I need to do I needed to do whatever I could to make her beefy so I made Elise the half orc cleric because I knew she was going to get knocked down but she would come right back up and that fueled my experience in Adventurers League which were those open tables I would love to see Darrington Press or Critical Role put some of that into the world I'm seeing some things that make me think they might be doing that um, because that became for you and I both us training teaching so many new players to engage in Dungeons and Dragons building a character yeah is daunting it is a daunting task for people um people like us i know loved bringing people in and showing them this world that they could be a part of and i'm really excited for playing with with a a new system a new adventure and with new folks you know who have never played yeah. tabletop Same. rpg it's gonna be so fun i also love them you know so that's how yeah cool. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, the the way we're running this, I think, is going to be super fun because we, we have our our core crew that we're running with these first adventures, but with the way we're setting this channel up to kind of process is as people become unavailable, we might reach out to new friends that we have enjoyed playing with in the past to jump in and do one-shots with us here and there, um, which will just, like, I think it's going to be super great for friendship of like having those games and like doing that stuff but the growth of the game itself because it's going to be getting uh more people invested in it and like kind of playing it and kind of thinking about it so they can kind of look at that stuff too yeah well and so maybe now is a good time to talk about forward path you know because I'll be very honest and I'm super glad that we did this kind of a test stream but that is part of what it was this is my first time being a streamer on Twitch it's not yours but it is mine and um, uh, at the beginning I definitely realized that audio issue and had to end stream and launch right back in so um, this was to introduce what Daggerheart is, what we're engaging with, who we are, and to talk about the system. But truly, that's not the meat of this channel. What our goal is, is to move through an adventure. We're planning on meeting next week for our session zero with our full crew. You're muted. <laughs> Super exciting. I love Session Zero. So they're always Me fun to too. sit in on. Um, I, I have gotten to actually do a pretty good Session Zero for the last couple of campaigns I've played in, and it just makes a world of difference. It does, yeah. I know that some people get a little bit, ugh, I don't know, iffy when you talk about safety tools. They are necessary. Don't go yeah. into a table not knowing if someone is going to commit violence that is That's unacceptable to you. you. Yeah. Safety tools, so good. Like, as a not politically correct all the time person, so good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so session zero next week, we do have a player who um, is having dental surgery. So hopefully we figure all of that out, but we want to make sure that we're not stressing our players out and that we're engaging this from a fun standpoint. So yeah. schedule is flexible. It's up in the air. And the goal is that we're going to have uh, session zero and then probably one to three sessions for the actual quick adventure, the uh, quick startup adventure that was published as part of this open beta. If you're interested in seeing that, please follow along hit the follow button you know yeah definitely yeah. we love we would love to have you along love to to get your you know opinions on how you're seeing mechanics play out from a outsider perspective yeah well because you know the other big piece of this is that during this play the biggest reason for doing this is that we are watching 
what could be our next favorite hobby evolve. And this is the time to get eyes on it and get feedback because if you don't do it, then in 2025, hi Mowgli, the little puppy. Anyway, in 2025, (laughs) when Daggerheart actually releases, you don't get a chance to to suggest anything anymore. Beggars can't be choosers. Let's choose now. So on the website, you know, going to their website, which I haven't really introduced very much at this point. So daggerheart.com. And remember, you can find all of this and more by following Critical Role, by following Darrington Press, D-A-R-R-I-N-G-T-O-N Press, um, which again is their publishing house. You can go on to there and and find more details, but daggerheart.com is the best area. If you go just to that, you're going to get access to Play Daggerheart. It gives you the ability to download all of the source materials. They have a video with Matt Mercer, and again, I've mentioned him a lot, but Spencer Stark. Oh, I love him so much. One of the developers of this game, I think the key developer, and just a delightful human, um, and has his hands all over so many cool things. Um, Please go follow him uh they have the open beta one shot that they did and everything um but yeah if you if you want to play dagger heart then you absolutely can you submit your email and it will launch a download file of all of the materials that you can see which includes like the you, you guys are literally seeing it right here 377 pages worth of manuscript it includes all of these different character sheets. Oh, I have zoomed way out. Let's uh, fix that real quick. Ooh. Okay, there we go. Um, all of these different items uh, are included in the package and a quick start adventure guide is in there. Um, you might want to familiar, familiarize yourself with Demiplane as well. Demiplane is specifically kind of like uh D&D Beyond is Dungeons and Dragons, Wizards of the Coast, Watsies kind of thing. Uh, Demiplane is more so for secondary and tertiary RPGs. No, I don't want to say that. Different yeah. systems. Yeah, it's got a lot of great systems on it. There, There's a lot of different things that you can use Demiplanes to like run and like host your characters and stuff. Um so it, it is it is definitely worth checking out, especially if you are um, trying to work your way through some different uh, tabletop RPGs. Yeah, absolutely, because they have so much on here. You know, you're mm-hmm. looking at the Marvel multiverse on here. They have, I think, they have One Piece on here. They have so many different. I know they have the new Avatar: The Last Airbender they stuff do. on here. Oh yes. Mm-hmm. So if you, because again, guys, if you, if the only thing you know about, um about tabletop rpgs is oh the masquerade so good yes is um dungeons and dragons you're missing out it's not the only flavor that they have uh and also it's definitely up. tip of the iceberg yeah they also have candela obscura already on here which again is the darrington presses group which is kind of an answer mm-hmm. to call of cthulhu because right. there were so many issues being leveraged against using call of cthulhu <laughs> um anyway yeah. uh, which is a great system it doesn't have anything to do with the horrible horrible author you know um but anyway <laughs> uh, but there's so much on here i would definitely recommend that you start looking at these items but uh We're going to begin playing next week. And remember that we're also going to have separate sessions. We will. And Stephen and I are going to start thinking through what those sessions are going to be. I know for sure we're probably going to start with character creation, both inside of Demiplane, as you saw me beginning today, uh, and then inside of an actual character sheet because everybody learns different ways. Everybody wants to engage in materials different ways. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we'll talk about character creation. We'll talk about our experiences running the game, any shifts that we see to the system based on open beta feedback, um, news and announcements as it comes out. But I'm just really excited that we're here and we're doing this together. Yep, it's it going to be so fun exciting. to play again, it's, Steven. It's going to be such a good time. Yeah, me and Rachel, uh, she's talked about a little bit. We, we started together with our Dean uh, Dungeons & Dragons adventure. Um 
we had a hiatus, a long hiatus, where we hadn't really been able to play or do any of that kind of stuff together. So this is super exciting. I moved west. Back. Yeah, I moved west. And it just, you know, we became adults. Things happened. I, you know, we had children. It became a little bit more difficult to try to do this kind of thing. But they're getting older, you know. I have a lovely wife that helps me take care of uh, all of that kind of background stuff. She got my camera working, which is um, I'm not my I'm not a tech person. My wife is. She's so much better than me. Yeah. Um, but uh, tinkering yeah, proficiency, no, it, or in this case, yeah, I don't know, sure. tinkerer as the experience yeah. proficiency. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, no, this is going to be a super exciting journey that we're kind of launching off on here. Um, I'm excited to see where it goes, you know, ideally if we have such a great time doing it and we can find a solid crew, maybe someday we are running a campaign. Um, but right now I think it's just going to be so much fun exploring different stories and like settings within the world. Yeah, I'm doing these little one shots. I really have, I mean, I know we're starting with the quick start adventure, but I hope that it's okay that I really want to take one more dive as GM before I hand it over to you because I have the best idea for a ribbit uh, campaign. Yeah, I'm yeah. so excited. No, for sure, for sure. Well, I mean, that's I think everything that I really wanted to talk about today. Anything yeah, I think that's have? a, a I think that's a good area to kind of leave off on. Hopefully, we have uh, whet the appetite of some people in our audience and kind of gotten them intrigued and thinking about you know what to expect from this and us. Um, but yeah, no, I think this is a good place for us to leave off for this evening. Do you have any dice handy right now? So specifically, I, was, I did not pull any dice out because I will not leave them alone. And I was afraid they would clickety clack in my mic all <laughs> evening long. Okay. Um, well, I was going to suggest that we did like a, a roll as like, the official first of this channel. I know that it's not because I already did it, but this we're not counting all of the other ones. Can I no. do it? You can, you can, you can. Do you want to get D12s too and you can do it with my backpack? Yeah, go find okay. them. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like clicking them aggressively. The exact thing you said not to do. <gasps> Chris is going to roll his too. If anybody oh has God. dice Let's out all get there on it. and you want to roll and report your feedback, I will... For Kyle in chat, I will take a picture of them. I know it's not solid evidence, but I will take a picture of them and put it into the Discord. By the way, please follow the Discord or join the Discord. Yeah, join us um, in Discord. Yeah. It would be so much fun to have people uh, to talk to in there besides me and Rachel and, and yeah. then, uh, just yelling into the ether at each other. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, which ones do I want to use? It's very important. I know, it is. And remember, you have right to choose one. one that is dark, representing your fear, and one Not that is one. light, representing your hope. I will say, um, my fear rolls way better than my hope does. Um, but find them fast, though, because we're closing. Can't no, be too picky. I can't be too picky. I'm missing one of my D12s, which is actually very upsetting. It but... really is. Okay. I will uh, use my uh, light blue as my hope and my poison green as my fear. Okay. All right. Are you ready? I'm, I'm so I'm, ready. I'm, I'm so go ready. I'm going to three, two, one, Yahtzee. Everybody at friend, at home, <laughs> not friend. Ready? Three, two, one, Yahtzee. <laughs> oh, it's bad. It's so bad. What is yours? I got a 17 with hope. Uh, how? Because that's a 17 isn't on a D12, friend. Uh, well, I got an 11 on my hope die. And I oh, got you got a 17 with hope. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. I got a 7 with fear. And <laughs> the, the hope die specifically was a one. So I'm telling oh, no. you, you guys, I am not the best at rolling. Please ignore my mouse pad when I send this picture, by the way, Kyle. I, I, it has like cat hair on it. But, you know, that's just the <laughs> life that I lead. That's the life that I lead. I won't it's apologize. Yeah. Anyway, I'll send that picture in. 
Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'll, fire, oh. I'll fire mine off to Discord as well. Okay. Well, that's it. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for joining. Yeah, I was so, so glad good. that we had people in chat and talking with us. That was super fun. Yeah. Um, uh, next week, I, I think, uh, hopefully, I'll ha we will have an even bigger crowd and more people excited to ask questions while we're doing um, uh, our, our session zero. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'll DM a game for you. Don't even worry about it, Kyle. I'm so excited. All right. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Love y'all so much. Happy adventuring and something about the faint divinities. Goodbye. Bye-bye. No, I have to figure out how to do the thing where it's oh, like, no. ha-ha. Oh, no. Okay, okay. I was doing my hands until it was done. Is they it can done? Still it is hear done. You. <laughs>